Okay, so we are going to dig into our first topic, and this is flame aerodynamics and flashback. And this is um, stuff out of chapter 10 of your text. So if you want to see some more details, I can refer you to there. I'd say I'm going to talk about the flashback problem in particular, but this is really a, a canonical example of how, and really the point I want to impress on you is how the flame and the flow are intimately coupled. And if you and when you treat them treat them in a decoupled fashion, you oftentimes miss really, really important things. Um, in other words, the flame influences what the flow does, but the flow influences what the flame does. So you, and, and this coupling occurs because of the gas expansion across the flame. And so, and so basically, the gas expansion across the flame coupled with kinetics, chemistry, flame propagation, you end up with some really, really interesting phenomenon. And what I'm going to show you here when we talk about this flashback problem in particular is, is that there is a lot more to this problem than meets the eye, and there's a lot more to it actually than is most books out there, most combustion textbooks out there. So let's first kind of define what we're talking about here. And now I want to, before I get into some science stuff, I want to just talk just practically speaking, and I want to differentiate between flashback and this word flame holding. And the, and the word by flame holding, what I don't mean here is flame stabilization. Flame holding is a word that's generally used in industry to refer to something which I'll define in a minute. But flashback is the upstream propagation of a premixed flame into a region not designed for the flame to exist. And what now if the flow velocity on average is less than the flame speed, well then this problem is kind of trivial. It's like, well, that's why flashback is occurring. But where this problem gets interesting is, is when you have situations where the flow velocity on average is greater than the flame speed. Well, then you can start asking yourself, well, how in the world can a flame move upstream into a flow that's higher than the velocity? And so, well, this occurs when your laminar flame speed or your turbulent flame speed exceeds the local flow velocity. So that might be obvious. Um, and so where can this occur? Well, you, you, in sort of classical analyses, you know that this can occur in a boundary layer. Right, where the, fl the flow velocity in the boundary layer has to go to zero, and you start balancing, quenching losses with how quickly the boundary layer heads to a zero velocity. Um, but I'll tell you, I'm going to give you an example here in a minute, where the flame and the flow can couple in such a way that the flame, uh, basically, it, it parts the waters in front of it. The flame actually forces the flow in front of it to be low velocity which causes the flame to advance, which forces the flow in front of it to be low velocity. This can happen either in the core of the flow or in the boundary layer. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And so a key point that I'm going to emphasize here is what's your reference flow speed and reference burning velocity. If you're thinking about, well, if you think about the flow, what's the flow field look like in the absence of the flame, realize that as soon as the flame is there, it changes what that flow field looks like, and you get a totally different answer. In the same way, if you're thinking about burning velocities, kind of reference burning velocities, reference flame speeds, just recognize that as soon as you put it in a flow, the flow is going to curve the flame, it's going to strain the flame, and it's going to change that flow velocity. So it's going to interact. OK, so that's what flashback is. Now, flame holding is a, is a different phenomenon. And again, when I'm using the word flame holding, there's different uses of this word in the literature. And I'm talking about, I'm, gonna, I'm using it here as I define it. Not, I don't mean flame stabilization. But in flame holding, what happens is, is is that the flame stabilizes in an undesired region after a flashback or autoignition event has occurred. So, in other words, the reason we have to differentiate between these is because the problem has, has hysteresis to it. So in other words, let me just back up. To this picture, it turns out that for real systems, Generally, the flame has multiple places where it can exist, and it will stay in one spot. It's perfectly happy to stay there, but if there's a perturbation, it can potentially sit in another spot. So the reason this is important is, let's suppose that you have this configuration. You have, you have fuel and air. They're pre-mixing. The flame sits out here. Suppose somehow that you introduced reaction right there. The flame holding problem refers to, and, and, and the somehow would be, you know, if there was a the system had a perturbation. Something there was a burp in the system. The airflow changed from how the flame popped upstream, or something changed. Um, and so the flame all of a sudden pop. It, it goes upstream. So now the question is: Now, when you return the system to normal operation, where the flame should sit out here, does the flame get disgorged, or does it stay there? 
So that's, and the way that, by the way, this is the way that companies do tests for this is they will actually take an igniter and they will light the igniter here, which will force a flame to be up in this mixing section, then they'll turn it off. And then, then the question will be, when they turn the igniter off, does the flame stay here or does it go away? So they say, does, the flame, does it hold flame or not? Um, and again, and this goes back to the fact that you have, the problem has hysteretic elements. So a simple example would be, and I'll explain a little bit more of this later, but a simple example would be if you had a lousy mixer that had a wake, all right? So you had some flow separation. And, uh, but that flow separate, that wake gets washed out so the flame doesn't, the flow field here is reasonably uniform. But if somehow the flame could go upstream, there's, there's a wake, there's flow separation, there's a low velocity region, and the flame could sit there, and it can sit there indefinitely. That would be the, the, uh, the flame holding out piece. Or it might be that, you know, you all, we all know about flashback, how there's this coupling between heat losses in the boundary layer, but how much quenching there is at the wall, you know, the flame propagating up this wall, a critical piece to that is, is, is whether the flame is quenched in the boundary layer. But that quenching is very, very significantly influenced by what's the wall temperature. So if there's no flashback, the wall temperature is just what the ambient temperature is. But once you get a flame there, that wall temperature goes way up to the flame temperature, and then it can have a feedback, and you basically get rid of the quenching phenomenon, and the flame can just park there. Okay. And so again, th these hysteretic elements come from both sort of wall temperature effects, which I just talked about, but they also talk, there's some intrinsically coupled heat release fluid mechanic phenomenon, which I'll get into with both boundary layers, as well as when you take a flow and you swirl it. Okay, so there's, what makes this problem more interesting is the fact that there's not one mechanism of flashback, there's multiple mechanisms. You can have flashback in your boundary layer, which we've just talked about. The boundary layer is a low velocity region. You can have flashback into, into the core flow. Um, and by core flow, what I mean is the, the part of the flow where the velocity is high, outside of the boundary layer. And we're gonna, when we talk about this, we're going to specifically focus on flows that are swirling. And so swirl means the flow has an azimuthal component to it. Because as soon as you introduce swirl, it turns out that there are new physics that happen where the flame and the flow interact with each other in such a way that you can get you can have a flow that's average flow velocity is 70 meters per second. The flame can still propagate upstream. And you could say, how can that happen if the flame speed is way below 70 meters per second? And I'll tell you the answer a little bit later. Um, another way you can get flashback, we're not going to talk about this, but I'll just mention in passing, is when you get very, very strong acoustic combustion instabilities. So when you have a combustion instability, you have large amplitude oscillations, which we talked about earlier. And a part of the oscillations means that the whole flow field is oscillating back and forth. And once the amplitude gets big enough, you can actually get low velocity flow or even reverse flow. Where, so the flow is actually going backwards through the system. And that will suck the flame upstream. And so it turns out that in practice, oftentimes what, when you have a very large amplitude combustion instability, what will actually damage the engine will be it will cause a severe flashback event, which will just all of a sudden and very quickly metal starts, starts melting. Um, and so you get these different mechanisms, and their relative significance is a function of, of lots of stuff. Um, and so there's, there's multiple different controlling parameters for each one of these mechanisms. So let me just, I'll just show you a couple quick videos of what's happening here. If I can find them. Um, Maybe I won't. I thought I had them here, but I, maybe I don't. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you a little bit later there. But these are examples of, these aren't videos, but I thought I had the video here, but I don't. Oh, uh, no, no, I'll show this to you a little bit later. Thank you, though. But I will show this one a, a little bit later. Um, that's one you were talking about, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm looking for a, this is a Kroner et al. and a Heger et al. paper. But I, I have some stills here, which I can show you. Um, but this would be an example of flashback in the core flow in this top right. And you see the flame moving upstream. And what's interesting about this is I, I can tell you in this case that that flow is, is moving. It's moving way faster than the flame speed. And so you ask yourself, well, how can it be? How can this flame move upstream and that flow velocity is, 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 is moving really fast? And we're going to talk about that. That's, that's this, uh, and, and the reason is partially had is to do with the, the fact that the flow has swirl. 
which is what I'm trying to draw with that arrow in that top image. And then uh, this is an image of a uh, flame flashing back in a boundary layer. This is a me scattering image. So the flow is seeded with uh, basically olive oil. The flow is going left to right. And so the, the olive oil is consumed at the flame. And when you shine a laser sheet across it, it's a nice visualization of where the flame is. So the, the flame instantaneously is right here. Flow is going, so the flame is propagating upstream this way, and it's propagating through this boundary layer right there. So you can see it there and there and there. We'll come back to this a little bit later. So let's start by talking about boundary layer flashback. And we'll start with kind of the classical treatment. I think most of you will have seen this before. And so, and by, and what I, what I mean by classical treatment is, is it's essentially a non-stretched isothermal analysis. Okay? So in other words, we're going to neglect the effect of heat release. So we're going to assume that the flow, we know the flow field. Which again is a classical analysis. As you say, let's assume I have a velocity profile with some critical gradient. In reality, you don't know what the flow velocity is because the flame changes it. So when you, when you, say, when you say, this is the flow velocity, this is my velocity profile, that's basically an isothermal approximation. Because you can't, you can't, tell, the, you can't tell the flame what the flow field should be because they're going to interact with each other. The other one is stretch, is that the burning velocity is a given, that it's not a function of the flow field itself or the curvature of the flame. So here is a profile, a velocity profile. Um, shown here. This would be a, a picture of what the flame might look like. And flashback occurs if the flame speed exceeds the flow velocity at some quenching distance from the wall. So the idea is, is that you have this quenching distance, del Q. Below that quenching distance, this is basically a high activation energy picture of what's happening, is that reaction goes from basically being a full, robust, intensely burning flame to basically zero over a very short distance. And that's this quenching distance, which you'll all be familiar with. And so, and then there's some associated flame speed at this quenching distance point, which is given by um, the flame speed at y equals del Q. Now, let me just back up a little bit and talk about nomenclature. Um, the, the nomenclature starts to get a little bit hairy here, and, and so just bear with me. SD, the substrip D denotes displacement speed. All right, so we'll get into this when we talk about flame speeds, but it turns out that there's two definitions of laminar flame speed. One is a displacement speed, the other is a consumption speed. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Nobody, okay, that's fine. You know, so that, that's great. You know, I've found that when I say how many of you don't know what I'm talking about, nobody ever raises a hand. So it's better to ask that question the other way around. Well, all right, we'll get into this later, but displacement speed is basically a measure of how fast a flame is moving with respect to the flow field. All right, a consumption speed is a measure of how fast, how quickly the flame is consuming reactants, and then you suitably normalize it to, con to convert a reactant consumption rate, which would be like kilograms per second, into a velocity. All right, now, the reason you won't have seen this before is because it turns out that for unstretched flat flames, the displacement speed and the consumption speed are the same. But as soon as you start to really stretch a flame, they're not the same. All right, so that's all that SD means is I'm talking about the displacement speed. The superscript U denotes the flame speed with respect to the unburned part. The alternative could be, sometimes you'll see in the, in the book and in here, a superscript D. That would be the flame speed with respect to the burn part. So what this means is I'm the, the, the displacement speed with respect to the reactant. So just recognize that when we talk about flame speeds for premix systems, it's, it's really what you're talking about is this how fast is a, is a specific ISO contour or a specific ISO progress variable to flame moving with respect to the flow field. And you can pick any ISO contour you want. Um, you can pick it with respect to the reactants, with respect to the, the front end of the flame, the back end of the flame, or anywhere in the middle. So all we're, and so laminar flame speeds, again, if, if you haven't seen this differentiation, just think of this as being SL, laminar flame speed. But just realize that, that you can measure more generally the, the, the flame speed as a function of the progress variable you use to define it. Um, does anyone have a question about that? They are for a flat plane. 
Yeah, so if you have a flame speed of 34 centimeters per second, let's say, which would be methane at 0.9, with respect to the reactants, if the gas expands by a factor of 6 across the flame, that means it would be 34 times 6 with respect to the products. It's a little bit more complicated once the flame starts getting curved and stretched, is you don't get that linear relationship between flow velocity across the two. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Anyone else have a question? All right. Okay, so this basically is just, and again, if you didn't understand a word I just said, just don't worry about it. Just cross this off and replace, write S sub L, the flame speed, right? The laminar flame speed. Uh, it just turns out that these distinctions start to matter when you start looking at really stretched flames, and we'll get into that more later. What this says is, so this is the flame speed at this quenching distance, and this is the flow velocity, U sub X. The X, the subscript X denotes the velocity in the X direction, right? So that's U sub X. So the velocity at Y equals del Q, so here's U X, it has a, it has a dependence on Y. What we're specifically interested in is how fast is the flame moving at this point with respect to the flow velocity. So this was basically, this equation here defines the sort of the boundary between two flow regimes, one where there's flashback and one where there's not flashback, right? Um, now generally we, what we do is we say, you know what, rather than treating the, analyzing this equation, what we'll do is we're going to assume that since this is happening in a boundary layer, we're going to assume that we can linearize the velocity around its value near the wall. So we'll assume that ux is 0 at y equals 0. And so we can basically expand ux at y equals del q in a Taylor series. So ux at y equals 0 is 0. So the leading order term is 0. Plus the first term of the Taylor's expansion is dux by dy times del q. And uh, so in this gradient, dux by dy, which is labeled right here, at y equals 0, we're going to call that g sub u, and that's the velocity gradient. The, the g is, is a gradient. Um, we're, we're going to, throughout the, the, the book, g denotes a velocity gradient. Okay, so in other words, I'm going to replace this term here, which is this term here, by g u times del q. So g u times del q equals s d at y equals del q. That's the, that's the condition. So if I basically take this equation and I just bring the SD over to the left-hand side, I end up with G times del q over SU subscript D equals 1. That, that basically what this does is it defines this number right here, which we're going to call the Karlovitz, a flashback Karlovitz number, a gradient, or a, basically a, a, a flow strain rate times a flame thickness. Oh, excuse me, and, and here I've equated the quenching distance with the flame thickness, which approximately correct, kind of an order of magnitude, divided by the flame speed, that this is a Karlovitz number. So when the Karlovitz number is nominally 1, defined these ways, that would be where you get flashback. And so, you know, in realizing this is all a scaling, what this suggests is that a good way to correlate flashback data is with this Karlovitz number. Well, it turns out that for open Bunsen flames, this is a, this is a great approach. Okay? So this is some pretty classical... Um, flashback data from 1950s where people were measuring this stuff, where what they did was actually went in and measured these critical gradients. They probably didn't measure the gradient. They probably used assumed poise flow and they knew a volume flow rate and they used the burner diameter and they backed out a gradient. But basically this is an inferred velocity gradient at flashback as a function of fuel air ratio. And this just shows data at a whole bunch of different um, preheat temperatures. T sub, sub T superscript U, again, denotes the unburned temperature, all right, unburned temperature. Um, and what you can see here is, is that in order to avoid, and by the way, uh, below this, below these lines, you get flashback. Above these lines, you don't get flashback. And so what this shows you, if you just pick a given temperature, a given reactant temperature, that it takes the highest gradient at an equivalence ratio of 1 to prevent flashback, and a lower gradient is possible at lower equivalence ratios or higher equivalence ratios. So this makes sense. It seems pretty intuitive. Um, and in fact, so this is kind of some classical data. What we did then was we said, you know, the beauty of, of modern chemical kinetics, and we got this great tool called ChemKin out there. We can actually calculate flame thicknesses and flame speeds. So that's what we did. We just took their data, and now we're, this is that Karlovitz number. 
plotted as a function of fuel air ratio. And this is that methane data is the, uh, the solid symbols. And you can see this data here all pretty nicely collapses. And it shows that for this burner, flashback occurs at a um, Karlovitz number around 0.5. But it, by the way, just if you're wondering, the um, open symbols are propane data uh, from the same experiment. But and, and so what we did was we did some detailed kinetic calculations using a methane mechanism and a propane mechanism to calculate flame speeds and to calculate flame thicknesses. One more word on nomenclature. Um, the superscript not, which you see here and there, denotes the unstretched value. Okay? So we've talked so in other words, when you when you take a flame and you stretch it, you curve it or whatever, you change the flame speed, you change the thickness. These just denote unstretched values. Um, but what this shows you is kind of from a first, a first cut, it shows you how you, know, you can use basic understanding of, you can use understanding of combustion physics coupled with modern kinetic tools that if you knew a flashback point at one condition, that you could pretty nicely predict what the flashback points at other conditions would be once you, once you baseline what that Karlovitz number is. Okay, so that's kind of a classical first pass treatment of all this stuff. Um, coming back to this, so, all right, so that's, that's one thing. Now let's, um, one more thing just to talk about, that's a laminar boundary layer. I'll just say one more thing about a turbulent boundary layer. And uh, the important thing to remember about a turbulent boundary layer is it's highly unsteady one, and it's, there's multiple zones. Remember, there's a viscous sublayer and a log layer and a turbulent boundary layer. And so in general, um, the, uh, the, if, if the flame is stabilizing outside of the viscous sublayer, that Taylor series expansion may break down um, and not be a very good approximation for the velocity at the quenching point. Um, here's a nice video, actually. So this is, this is the video that I had in here of a flame which is wanting to flash back in a turbulent boundary layer. What you're looking at, this is some data from Thomas Saddlemeyer at TU Munich. And um, the flow is going right to left. And basically what it is is it's a diffuser. So um, the, uh, the side view of this thing would look like this. So you have reactants going this way. So the flow is slowing down as you move in this direction. And what happens is, is that the flame is propagating this way. But it's a nice way to have a, a flame that's flashing back sit still in your frame of view because the velocity is steadily increasing this way. So this is what the flame looks like from a side view. You were actually looking at it from the top in this movie. And you can see there's significant space-time unsteadiness. You see these fingers zipping up in, upstream into the reactants. Um, so, ah, come on. Anyway, just kind of a nice view of, of what's happening. And uh, I don't have time to get into this, but there's some really intera interesting interactions of the flame with the boundary layer instability. So for those of you who've had, well, you, I know of you all have taken a shear flow or a viscous flow class, and you know that you have these pullman schlichting waves and these V waves and stuff in the boundary layer. So what you're seeing here is that the flame is in interacting with those, those um, horseshoe vor vortices and things like that in the boundary layer. Okay. Um, All right, so now I want to move off of the um, the uh, kind of this classical treatment. Let's just, I apologize, I know I'm zipping back and forth. But if we just come back to this equation here, right here, what I want to do now is say, well, what we assumed that the velocity at, that we kind of knew this velocity, right? In reality, we don't really know this velocity. And we'll, we'll talk now about why that is. In reality, we also, if the flame is stretch sensitive, we don't know the flame speed. So I want to dig into that a little bit. Let's start by talking about the velocity field. And to do this, I want to back up a step. So we're not going to talk about flashback for a minute. I want to talk about just, just generally what happens when you have gas expansion across a curved flame. All right. Now, someone just already pointed this out. If you have a flat flame when you have gas expansion, the effect is quite simple. And that is you have some density ratio across the flame. Flow is coming into the flame at one velocity. Stream tube area doesn't change because it's a 1D geometry. And the velocity going out of the flame is just the density ratio times the approach flow velocity. So if you have 300 degree Kelvin reactants, 1800 K products, 
the flow is going to accelerate six times. It's going to be moving away six times faster than it's coming towards. And that's just purely, you know, that's continuity equation, right? That's just, uh, if this is my flame, I'll even give it a little thickness. These are my streamlines. Then I know from continuity of mass that rho ua, rho ux times the cross-sectional area of this stream tube here, and rho, and I'll even put a superscript u on top of it, just because this is unburned, and rho, oh, you guys aren't going to be able to see this, are you? Sorry. Uh, okay, well, let's try again. Um, tell you what, I'll write over here when I'm right, writing over there. So rho superscript b, u sub x, the x velocity, superscript b burned, times the same cross-sectional area. Since the areas are the same, they cancel, and this just tells you that ux b over ux unburned, ux burned over ux burned is equal to rho unburned over rho burned, right? Just continuity of mass. Okay, that's, that's what happens in 1D. Well, as soon as a flame is not flat, you get some really cool stuff that happens that makes, that, that leads to all kinds of interesting physics. And uh, I'm not going to have time to prove this to you, but it turns out that as soon as you curve a front where, as soon as you curve a front, what it does is, because the Navier-Stokes equations, you know, you, in an incompressible flow, because the flow feels everything everywhere, what that does is it changes the upstream flow. So in other words, and just to illustrate this, here I've, I've drawn in some streamlines. This is a calculation of what happens if you take a, a front with a density jump and you curve it, all right? And if you curve it, what happens is, and, and, and the solid lines denote um, pressure isobars, by the way. Um, so in, in the flame changes the pressure field in front of it, and we know that acceleration occurs normal to uh, pressure isobars. But what basically happens is, is that the flow converges into regions of the flow that are concave into the reactants. And the flow diverges, so notice the streamlines are going out, into the part of the front that is convex to the reactants. Okay? Opposite thing happens on the products. These, these things will then diverge, and these things will converge. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if you take a flame and you uh, bulge it into the reactants, the flow, because of this divergence, notice how the flow is diverging, again, because of continuity, because now the stream tube area is growing, all right? How am I going to draw so everybody can see? I can't, can I? Can you guys see over here? Okay. Um, let's just draw... So if here's my flame, let me just draw, I'll just draw it with a real small thickness here. But the point is, is that the flow is going like this in front of it. All right, and then it goes like that. It, then it re re returns to being 1D afterwards. Um, so again, you can just do, if you do mass flow in equals mass flow out, since we're upstream of the flame, the density doesn't change. So therefore, the flow velocity has got to drop by whatever this divergence angle is, right? So the flow is decelerating upstream in the flame. Well, and in the same way, the pressure is rising, right? What makes a flow decelerate? The pressure and velocity go in the same direction, right? That a decelerating flow, a flow decelerates into a rising pressure. That, that, um, and so that there is actually an adverse pressure gradient in front of this bulge, and the flow is decelerating. Okay? Streamlines diverge, approach flow decelerates, adverse pressure gradient. So as soon as you take a non-isothermal propagating front and you curve it, you get this new, these, these things which happen. So what do you think, let's talk about what that's going to do. Um, well, what do we know about boundary layers? We know boundary layers don't like adverse pressure gradients, right? What happens when you have an adverse pressure gradient in a boundary layer? There you go. Good job. Um, adverse pressure gradients lead to boundary layer separation, right? So in other words, what this says is, you know, in this analysis, um, here, this is kind of our zoom in into the boundary layer. We kind of assumed we knew what the boundary layer, what the velocity profile was doing. As soon as the flame is in that boundary layer, we know that the flame is going to want to, it's going to be back pressuring the boundary layer, and that boundary layer might separate. Again, 
So we don't actually know what the velocity is. The flame and the, and the flow field interact with each other. So we're going to talk about that in a minute here, and I'm going to actually show you some data where that happens. Um, in swirl flows, we'll get into this a little bit later. Um, how many of you know what vortex breakdown is in a swirl flow? Okay, well, I'll tell the rest of you. Vortex breakdown is this really interesting fluid mechanic phenomenon. Imagine I take a pipe, okay? So you have a pipe, and the flow is going through the pipe at 100 meters per second, okay? In a flow where, in a, in a non-swirling flow, you're going to have, you know, some boundary layer profile or quasi profile of its laminar. Average flow velocity, 100 meters per second. Now let me start to add some swirl. All right, so let me add, spin it. Turns out that above a critical ratio of azimuthal velocity to axial velocity, you get a fluid mechanic instability. The, fl the flow becomes unstable. Just like turbulence, the flow becomes unstable and, just, and you get turbulence. But a different type of instability, and you get a phenomenon called vortex breakdown. And vortex breakdown, one of its manifestations is you get a stagnation point um, on the flow. All right. So let me just draw another picture to show what I'm talking about. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about this later, but I'll just tell you. Straight tube, flow zipping along here. When you get vortex breakdown, stagnation point, that means the flow velocity goes to zero, all right? And what you do is you actually get this recirculating cell here, two stagnation points. And then the rest of the flow zips around it. And so you get this strong deceleration of the flow, and then it goes around it. So the velocity, on average, I said is 100 meters per second. So continuity means that the velocity that's squeezing through this part is going a lot faster than 100 meters per second. But you actually get reverse flow. It's a, it's a fascinating fluid mechanic instability where you'd think, well, the flow's got to be going that direction. But it's actually going backwards. It's going, you get a recirculation cell. But, in a, like this straight pipe that I just drawn here, the location at which vortex breakdown occurs is pretty random, and it actually this cell can kind of drift back and forth, and it does these things. But it turns out that vortex breakdown is really sensitive to adverse pressure gradients, where it occurs. And so the flame can actually trip. It can force breakdown, vortex breakdown to occur. So this phenomenon is going to couple really, really strongly with a, an exothermic front. All right. So that's swirl flumes. Um, Triple flames. Again, so I'm not talking about, I'm talking more generally than flashback here. So, kind of an interesting observation people have made about, so let's, let me just draw a picture so we all are oriented here. Fuel, air, separated by a splitter plate. This is going to give me, can you guys see this? Just raise your hand if I'm drawing, if I start encroaching in that direction. So we all know that this is a, this is kind of a classic non-premixed flame problem, and we're going to get a non-premixed flame, right? Downstream. But right at the exit, that the gradients are so strong, the scalar dissipation rate so high, generally the flame doesn't actually sit, start here, right? It doesn't, it extinguishes. It starts some distance downstream. And um, but this distance lets some fuel and air mix, so I actually have a a certain amount of premixing, and so you actually get this triple flame, right? How many of you have seen what I'm drawing here? Okay, so this is called a triple flame because you have three flames. So this is a rich premixed flame. Okay, so this is rich premixed here. Um, I apologize that you can't see this. That's not left. But lean premixed that branch, and then that branch right there is a non just standard non premixed flame. Okay? Now, one of the things people have spent lots of time looking at is what's, you know, what's this distance? How far down does it stream? Under what conditions will this non premixed flame blow off, etc.? And there's been a lot of a lot of speculation that, in fact, the stability of a premixed flame, by, by stability I mean the conditions under which you, the flame does and does not blow off. Although it's a non-premixed flame, it's pretty much controlled by premixed flame propagation because you get this premixing upstream. And so what happens is, is that the flame will stabilize at a point where the flame speed matches the flow speed. Okay? Now, 
suppose that, let's just eliminate shear for a minute. Let's suppose that the fuel and air are moving at some velocity, some average velocity. I'll just call it U ref, okay? When people actually go in and do measurements, they find that the flame is actually sitting, and, and yeah, excuse me. Yeah, so they find that the flame is actually sitting at a point where the flame speed, excuse me, they're, they're sitting at a point where the flame speed is um, less than U ref. You might say, well, how, how can that happen? How can the flame sit at a point where the flow velocity is higher than the uh, than how fast the flame can propagate? We all know that for a flame to a premix flame to sit steady state at a point, the flow speed and the flame speed have to match. The reason for that is is because U ref is not the velocity here. This U ref is lower. Excuse me. This velocity here, the actual velocity that the flame sees is lower than UF. So again, the flame kind of like parts the waters in front of it. The flame slows the flow down in front of it so that the flow, the, the flame can actually sit in a region where if you neglect a gas expansion, the flame couldn't simply not exist. And it, the reason for that is is because of this curved leading edge of the, of the front. Um, so that's another example of this phenomenon. So these are all, all these three examples here just go back to the fact of what does a curved exothermic front due to the flow. Last example here is flame stability. How many of you are familiar with the Darius-Landau instability? Okay, so the Darius-Landau instability, basically it was some, some work where people looked at unstretched flames which without stretch sensitivity and they said, you know what? It's impossible to have a flat flame. If you take a flat flame and you add a little wrinkle to it, the wrinkle is going to grow. So all real premix flames should be wrinkled. And the Darius-Landau instability is due to the exact same effect. So if we go to this picture here on the top right, if you take a flat flame, and let's just say we add a little wrinkle to it, like I've shown here, you now know that this part of the wrinkle is the flow is going to decelerate. And because, and so now the flame speed is going to be higher than the flow speed. So the flame is going to move in that direction. Here, the flame, the flow accelerates. So that's going to push the flame that way. So what the end result of this is, you take a flat flame, you add just the tiniest little disturbance to it, that disturbance will grow in time. And that's the Darius-Lando instability. It basically says, as soon as you have a, have a propagating front where the density drops across the front, it's impossible to have a flat flame. Well, it turns out that when you include stretch effects, that that can sometimes that stabilizes certain wavelengths and things like that. But bottom line is this Darius-Landau instability is just another manifestation of this same phenomenon. The um, okay, so that's the coupled effects of flame curvature and gas expansion. Now let me just talk about the the coupled the coupling effects of how the flame influences the boundary conditions the flow sees. All right. So if you take a non-reacting boundary layer, this this is actually data. This is this is real data. Typical velocity field for a boundary layer might look like that, right? Y U it looks like that. Well, but as soon as you have a flame in a boundary layer, it starts heating up your walls. And you can go to Schlichting's book selecting boundary layer theory and you and you can look at the analysis of what happens when you take a flame take a boundary layer with heated with, with a non adiabatic wall where you're adding heat from the wall okay so if, they, if, if you have as soon as um, the flame heats up the wall and because of conduction the wall isn't going to start heating up the approach flow well that changes the boundary layer profile and in fact it's a destabilizing influence it, it, it tends to put an inflection point in the uh, in the uh, boundary layer. So just to illustrate what I'm talking about here, if this is my boundary layer, here's my flow. If I have a flame sitting here, let's say it's starting to propagate upstream, okay, the flame is going to be dumping heat into the wall, right? The wall says, through conduction, starts pumping heat in that direction, which starts adding heat to the reactants. Everybody with me? So you now have a non-adiabatic boundary layer. You have a boundary layer where heat is being added to the flow. Again, that's destabilizing. That, 
I, I won't do the analysis for you, but you can just take, take the boundary layer equations and look at what's the effect of heat addition from the wall, and it tends to add an inflection point. And so this is actual data illustrating this. As soon as you add, you take that boundary layer, you turn the flame on, this is the velocity profile we measure. So you see how this boundary layer hasn't separated, but it's thinking about separating. You see that, that inflection point. Um, okay, so I hope this gives you, this starts to give you a feel for, wow, you know, there's a whole lot more to this problem than classical analysis because the flame, both through its direct, because once the flame starts to become curved, okay, let's, let's just back up here. So again, any, the flame is going to develop a shape like this if it's, when it's flashing back or like I've drawn over here. It starts distorting the approach flow field and as well as the flame by this mechanism of just drawn pumping heat into the flow, it's going to, we don't know what the flow velocity is going to look like in front of it, but 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 apparently it's going to it's it's going to be making the boundary layer thinking about separating. So just to illustrate this, I want to show you some data. This is some really nice data from um, Thomas Saddlemeyer at uh, TU Munich. Uh, and what he did was he did an experiment where he looked at, bound, at at flashback, where the flame was stabilized basically at the outlet of this tube. So it was an unconfined sort of classical analysis. But he also looked at flashback conditions where the flame was, was very confined. And so he looked at, he would stabilize the flame on this step and look at flashback. And uh, <coughs> what he measured then was the critical velocity gradient that was required to um, flashback a flame as a function of fuel air ratio. This is a lean, a lean mixture. And so you get, you know, as a function of stoichiometry, when you have an unconfined flame, as you move towards stoichiometric, you got to have a steeper and steeper velocity gradient to not have flashback. That's what that shows. But what the interesting thing part about this was, was when they did the confined experiment, they showed that it took a significantly higher velocity gradient to pre prevent flashback. Um, so if you used kind of basic isothermal kind of analysis and said, you know, shouldn't matter, you know, you'd be off by, you know, a factor of a five in terms of, of critical velocity gradients. Um, and the reason for that is due to these, is, is largely due to these effects which I've talked about. And let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. Actually, excuse me, one more thing. I've talked about the velocity field effects. Let me just say one more thing about stretch effects. Is that, <clears throat> again, because of positive curvature, if you have a flame with what's called a negative Markstein length, so if you don't, how many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you are, know what Markstein numbers are or Markstein lengths? Okay. Well, turns out that if you have a flame with what's called a negative Markstein number, we'll get into this more tomorrow, the flame here, this flame accelerates. The flame speed is actually higher than the laminar unstretched value, which is what I'm trying to show here, is that the flame speed can be much, much greater than the unstretched flame speed. That's what the superscript knot means. And so the laminar unstretched flame speed can be a significant underestimate of flame speeds. Okay, but let's, uh, let me just show you how this works. Now, this is some data. Again, this is that, that data from um, Heger et al. And <coughs> what you're looking at here, these are PIV velocity field measurements. And so you're looking at the velocity vector. This right here is the instantaneous flame front. And uh, this flame is flashing back. It's propagating up the boundary layer. All right. What I'm showing you here, this hatched region is region where the flow velocity is, is negative. In other words, nominally the flow is going bottom to top. This region, the flow is going backwards. So what's happened? This flame, because of these effects, these destabilization effects, that the flame adverse pressure gradients the boundary layer, the boundary layer separates. What happens when the boundary layer separates? You get reverse flow. Okay? That's shown here. Now all of a sudden the flame isn't being, isn't fighting a flow that's pushing it away. It's being pulled forward. All right? So this flame says, wow, the velocity is going, let me, let me just move forward. Well, as soon as the flame moves forward, it back pressures this bound, part of the boundary layer and you get separation. And so the approach flow actually sucks the flame into the nozzle because of this aerodynamic effect. So, isn't that cool? So that's, that's how much fun combustion is. You know, you start coupling fluid mechanics with, with, uh, with, with flames, you get some phenomenon that isn't present when you look at either um, phenomenon in isolation. Does anyone have a question? <coughs> 
Uh, you know, I can't remember what fuel this is for. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Okay. But I, this is, I love this experiment. I mean, it just demonstrates the point so nicely of what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what they're I, 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 there's a, there's a lot of interesting things around this experiment. What they were trying to do with the problem with an unconfined experiment is you have this massive adverse pressure gradient as the flow dumps out into the open. And that adverse pressure gradient completely swamps out anything the flame is ever going to do. And so, which is why this kind of classical theory works for tubes opening out into the environment, is because, you know, you, the, the flame is, the, the flame effect on the flow is really, really subtle. By doing this, you got to, you know, to get the experiment started to make it steady state, they got to add a tiny little lip to hang onto the flame. But here, and there's a slight adverse pressure gradient, but, but here you can really start to see how the flame um, uh, starts altering the pressure field. So you can imagine that what happens is, basically what happens is, is, let's just go to the open tube. This is the unconfined critical gradient, all right? So it's hard for the flame to flash back, but let's suppose that, there's a, let's just say there's a perturbation, that somehow the flow velocity all of a sudden drops, and you, the flame starts to propagate back. As soon as it starts to propagate back, you move into this confined world. And so even if the flow velocity were to increase back to where it was, once the flame is in here, this feedback loop, the flame um, back pressuring the boundary layer, the flame will st still keep flashing back even though that it's, it's above this critical gradient. Does that answer your question? So a more general question where you have a tube transitioning to some area expansion, you'd have to do the analysis for what, how much the flame is 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 back pressuring the flow relative to just what the the, the flow on its own is doing due to that nominal um, adverse pressure gradient. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, why does a bulging flame front um, modify the streamlines? So you're basically asking, why does the flow do this? <clears throat> you know, that is a great question, and I've I've sat and puzzled over it. Of of a simple, I mean, you you when you work out the coupled momentum equation and mass conservation mat and continuity equation, this is what you get. But I I can't give you just a simple, oh, you know, this does that and that does this. It's it's a it's a complicated problem because it's um. It, it, it turns out that as soon as you curve a flame, the flame starts producing vorticity, and that vorticity alters the flow field as well. So I can't, I wish I could. And if anybody thinks of a nice, simple back of the envelope explanation of why a curved flame does this to the flow, I, but, I, but I, I can't give it to you. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Yeah, so the question there was there's different kinds of instabilities, um, thermodiffusive, hydrodynamic, um, and then Sapman, Taylor, there's, there's lots of them. So the thermodiffusive instability, we're, we're actually going to talk about that a little bit later, that is a, that shows up when flames have a stretch sensitivity, when they have non-zero Markstein numbers, <coughs> when they have negative Markstein numbers in particular is where that occurs, and that generally matters for disturbance wavelengths that start to become on the order of the flame thickness. So short disturbances are strongly influenced by thermodiffusive instability. The hydrodynamic instability is this instability here, also called the Darius-Landau. It's, it's a fluid mechanic, it's a non, 
It's a non-constant temperature fluid mechanic instability. It's always there. Uh, it has a certain growth rate. So, you know, how, um, how big that growth rate is relative to other things. Um, so in premix flames, and then the other important premix flame instability is the Safman-Taylor, which is a, a very, when you have very, very small gap widths, that one shows up. But, you know, non-premix flames have also their own intrinsic instabilities, but it starts, it starts to become difficult to make general comments. Anyone else have a question? Okay, so why don't we take a break? It's 4.04. Let's, uh, since I've been talking a little too long here, let's just break for six minutes.